Good morning, party people. Welcome to Office Hours. I uh, am uh, here down in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico, doing a, a rather unusual daytime live office hours. Uh, normally, I am down at the beach. I would move the camera to like point it right over there. Down at the beach, uh, watching whales go by and drinking either Bloody Marys or tequila or water, whatever it ends up being. But let's go through and take a look at the questions that you have in here from over in Polgab. And if you're joining in and you want to ask your own question or vote on which questions I cover during the next 15-20 uh, minutes, you can do that via the link over there at the top, polgab.com slash room slash Brento. SQL Simeon says, everybody loves free advice, but we want war stories. Okay, so the thing with war stories is you got to be really careful about obfuscating whatever happened at the client because you don't want to tell the story exactly as is and then have people feel bad if they were the subject of it, violate non-disclosure agreements, uh, have people put the pieces together. You just got to be really careful about how you go about doing that. So what I tend to do is I like think about the stories ahead of time and craft how I'm going to say them in a way that doesn't hurt anybody's feelings or, or that lets enough time pass. Some of my war stories are 10, 15 years old. And I save those for my paid training classes. I tend to not do those on the live streams these days. I tend to hold those for my paid training classes. So that's where those go. One of the questions, oh, Gabriel, good to see you. Um, one of the questions uh, that he follows up with are, what are the most exotic places you've parachuted in? I will tell you that because it's kind of funny. Um, so I've had my favorite place I think that I've ever gone to for client work was Isle of Man. I got to be careful because it sounds like I love man, which, you know, could also be true. Nothing wrong with that. But Isle of Man off the coast of the United Kingdom, it's kind of sort of part of the United Kingdom, but weirdly, not really. That was one of my favorite places that I've ever been. I have been all over the world, all over North and North and Central America and Europe. I still haven't been to uh, Asia, Australia, South America. And sometimes people will be like, oh, hey, sequel sucks. Sometimes people will be like, well, why don't you go to those places? It all just depends on where clients want to take me to. And obviously, I, I don't want to go somewhere that's really expensive that costs a lot to fly in and out of if it's just coming out of my own pocket. Next up, Cave of Wonders asks, uh, SQL Synonym says, uh, or SQL Synonyms are a new concept to my friend. A whole new world. Uh, and we were wondering what your thoughts are in synonyms. Oh, ne Netherlands in the house. Uh, good to see you, G-Surgeon. Uh, do you have any pointers to keep in mind or, or uh, when writing or tuning queries? There's nothing you have to worry about with tuning queries. There's nothing you have to worry about with writing queries. Synonyms just work. There should be a giant asterisk over my head when I say that. Um, there can be gotchas around, if I remember right, triggers. And of course, foreign keys don't work when you cross database objects, but you're cross databases. But usually by the time where you're at the point where you need synonyms in order to, for example, move an object to a lower latency or lower priority availability group database, like you're going to have an async AG database for uh, slowing down the write issues or write log and hater sync commit type issues. Um, by the time you get to that, you don't really care about things like uh, foreign key integrity because they would just slow down the object rights too much. Oh, DJ Khaled is here. Khaled uh, Bujaja is uh, here. Good to see you as well. Uh, it's funny. We see all the regulars now that I'm here during regular daylight hours where y'all are clearly like all supposed to be working, whereas after hours you don't turn in because you're actually doing personal life stuff, which I respect. I'm all about that. Kind of funny how that works out. Andrew says, for some of our actual query plans in Management Studio, the, some of the node costs adds up to over 100%. Is this a bug in SSMS? Most likely what you're looking at um, is that you're comparing the estimates versus actual numbers as opposed to the costs of the individual operators. 
These days, when you look at Management Studio at an actual plan, there are two percentages. One is the cost of the operator. The other is estimates versus actual. Now, on an old boat anchor version like what you've got there, SQL Server 2014 Service Pack 2, you might just only be seeing the costs, and in which case, I wouldn't be surprised if those costs were inaccurate. 2014 Service Pack 2, holy cow, that's old. I want to say Service Pack 3 is out for 2014. Yeah, 2014 has Service Pack 3 and cumulative update four. So go get on current patch levels on uh, SQL Server itself before you go worry about things like percentages. Next up in the highly voted list, uh, Rick asks, and Gabriel, I'm gonna hit your question next uh, just because you happen to be online. Um, uh, Rick asks, what is your, <laughs> I immediately think Rick and Morty, what is your experience with letting the SAN compress large backups instead of doing the compression with SQL Server? So if you are doing compression with SQL Server, then you write less going across the network from the SQL Server to wherever the storage lives. And network can also mean storage area network. So if you do SQL Server compression, you're sending less across the wire. This also means at restore time, your restores can be faster for two reasons. One is that you're not waiting for the SAN storage to decompress the data. And two, because the SAN storage is not sending the full data, full restore size across the storage area network. It's only sending a small size over the network, the, the compressed backup size. So the, the thing that I would just say is make sure that you tune it and test it. And the way that I would test it is if the SAN administrators say, just don't worry, everything on the SAN is compressed, try to restore a backup from a week ago. Try that with both SQL Server native compressed backups uh, that aren't going to a compressed volume on the SAN and to a compressed volume on the SAN. Because I have seen, oh, Richie, I started stop watching uh, Dave Grohl on Hot Ones for this. I haven't seen that episode yet. I, I've got to totally go watch that after this. Um, so I've seen uh, issues where an underpowered SAN, like somebody bought a really underpowered filer and they were trying to use the, the filer was already like maxed out a CPU. Uh, and it was the backups, the restores were taking forever to run because the SAN had to piece together all these compressed uh, objects from all over the place in order to combine and uh, create one backup file. So that's, that's the pros and cons there. Uh, next up, Swede DBA says, oh, I'll, I'll, um, G Surgeon, I'll hit you, Gabriel, I'll hit you next. Uh, uh, Swede DBA says, our application has one database per customer. Currently, we run 20 to 30 customers per instance and around three instances per physical server. Would running all this on one instance be more beneficial instead to allow SQL Server to balance resources better? The question I would ask you is how do you come up with three instances? What makes you think that three instances are better than one? And if three are better than one, why don't you run an instance for every database? And you might go, well, that's a lot of instances to manage. There's a lot of overhead for all the SQL servers. Exactly. I think you might have just answered your own question there. I love it when that happens. Damn it, I, I picked another one off the most highly voted list. This is the thing with poll gabs. It makes it so easy for me as a presenter to just pick the most highly voted ones, and then I forget about Gabrielle's question. All right, one more before I do Gabrielle's question. Um, Mahir says, Brent, besides price, what criteria should you uh, use when evaluating SQL monitoring software? You know what? I wrote a blog post for that. If you search for Brent Ozar, how to choose monitoring software, I've got a detailed checklist on how you go about doing exactly that. So go hit your friend Google on that one. And put my name in, though, too. That way that you'll get my answer. All right, now I'm actually going to click on Gabriel's answer. Or question, question, not his answer. Gabriel says, if my head friend had to monitor 500 remote clients Postgres, what the what? 
I would, what the, why didn't I read your question before I put it up on screen? This is the danger of taking the most new questions instead of letting people vote first. If my friend had to monitor 500 remote clients Postgres and 500 remote SQL Server, what tool would you recommend? I don't do any Postgres monitoring at all. Like that's to me, um, that's what Amazon RDS is for. That's the reason that Richie and I use Amazon Aurora RDS, po Amazon Aurora, Amazon RDS Aurora Postgres. Got to get the verbs or nouns exactly right, I suppose, or adjectives, depending on how you think of them. Um, and, and Richie says, tool liquor, he and I get to drink, and I was going to say drink, but this is just espresso, which is probably the opposite of, I mean, it's not bad, but uh, we get to relax and let Amazon take care of the monitoring. And it's not to plug Amazon over Microsoft. Microsoft has their own managed Postgres as well. But then the monitoring is kind of built into it. Is it good monitoring? No, it's not as good as what you would get if you spent one to two thousand dollars US per server. But obviously, if you spent one to two thousand dollars US per server and you had a thousand remote clients, it, it just doesn't make sense. Now, I bet that Gabriel's asking it from the sense of a consultant who manages lots of client servers, and I just don't have an answer there for the Postgres servers. For the SQL servers, I would recommend Brent Ozar Unlimited's Constant Care. With Constant Care, you pay one low price. I don't remember exactly what the price is, but that's what happens when I do an office hours first thing in the morning. With Constant Care, you pay one low price for one email address where all the monitoring instances, monitored instances go. And then you can monitor all of your client servers, giving you actionable information on exactly what steps you should take next. That is Brent Ozar Unlimited SQL Constant Care. It's perfectly crafted for busy consultants like you. End of sales pitch. One million dollars, yeah, because Richie's the developer, of course. He's like, you know, how about we all get to buy boats? Uh, so that's SQL Constant Care. You know, and it's funny, so just as a side thing, um, when Richie and I started designing it and architecting it and all that, I was like, look, there's nothing to say that we couldn't build a collector for a data collector for MySQL and for Postgres. We absolutely could do that. Um, but we just never got around to doing it because then also we have to actually build the advice on MySQL and Postgres. And frankly, Richie and I are not good people to give you advice on how to tune MySQL and Postgres. Um, if you are the kind of person who can tune Amazon RDS uh, Aurora Postgres, please give us a call. Well, not a call because I don't like phone calls, but an email. Don't call me if you just tune Postgres. That's just not useful for me because RDS Aurora Postgres is just a little bit different in terms of its performance tuning, especially if you could tune vacuums for us. That would be awesome. Do not tell me here's a web link to go to where everything's easily explained because we've tried that stuff. Next up, we have Calvin. Calvin asks, Hi, Brent. When should you disable a non-clustered index via dr versus drop it like it's hot? Does disabling free up any space? Well, Calvin, what a lot of people would do is they would actually try disabling an index, and then they would realize right away whether or not it drops any space. Not you, though, Calvin. Calvin, you rely on my opinion in order to form your own uh, ideas. So for that, Calvin, for people like you, I have a fundamentals training course. During March, we are doing uh, Fundamentals Week absolutely live. So you can see me spoon feeding you this information just like a little baby bird becoming slowly mature and more intelligent. We hope we will always hope for one price you get to attend like an entire week's long worth of conferences with me where I cover the fundamentals of index tuning, query tuning, parameter sniffing, how to use the first responder kit and more. If you're the kind of person who just absolutely refuses to run experiments on your own and you want me to teach you how to do it or if you just want to see me mercilessly roast people who aren't smart enough to figure out things on your own, by all means drop in to my fundamentals week class. You can learn more about that over at Brento's r.com slash go slash fundamentals and the price for that week-long worth of training is way more reasonable than you might expect so that's over at brentozar.com slash go slash fundamentals 
Next up, we have Neil asks, my f company runs, <laughs> SQL Sox says, here comes the real Brent. That's absolutely true. Um, my company runs 15 merges every minute to sync an online store with the ERP database. What's the alternative? Uh, can SSIS be used? What is SSIS? What is love? Baby, don't hurt me. See, Neil plays it smart and safe because Neil knows that as long as I hear something or see something that's going to trigger me to vibe to 1990s dance music, he's probably safe. Um, so SSIS and Azure Data Factory are the kinds of things that are really good for this, for looking at change detection and only copying across things that change. But man, when you tell 15 times a minute, that's every four seconds. That's insane. Do you really need the data every four seconds? And if you ask the users, of course, their answer is going to be yes. But I bet a lot of the times the process runs longer than four seconds, so it ends up missing the schedule. So if you find yourself truly needing data within four seconds, I would switch over to things like always on availability groups and replicate the data somewhere else, live transactional replication so that it's built into the engine and you don't have to build something separate in order to support it. So that's where I would probably go. Uh, is it doable, all these things with SSIS and Azure Data Factory every four seconds? Yeah, but it's immediately going to set off alarms with anybody who's done any kind of this data movement. Uh, if they're doing it every four seconds, they're like, hold on, I think we're missing the point on something. I don't think this is quite right. Next up, we have, I'm picking some of the recent ones that have just come in because these people are probably uh, uh, in on the webcast, and then I'll go back to the highest rated ones. Um, Drew asks, SQL is randomly throwing 824 corruption errors. <laughs> and the vendor says there's no problem. Oh, I'm sure that they do. Uh, what are our next steps? Um. That scares the bejesus out of me. When you say it's a brand new sand and you're throwing corruption errors, um, I, I would kind of start to ask questions to the vendor and go, okay, maybe it's us. Could you introduce us to other customers that you have of a similar size to us who also use SQL Server? And if their answer is no, I think you might have the answer right there. I think it might be some somebody got cheap and played some kind of fly-by-night vendor like Bob's Discount Storage. Uh, but I have not seen uh, any kind of new storage in the last 10 years that would be corruption like that. My guess is that, oh, 95 bucks a month, that's, that's true. I forgot we have monthly pricing in as well. Um, my guess is that you probably got something configured wrong on the on the storage side. And as soon as the storage vendor hears that you want to talk to one of their other customers, that's probably going to set off alarm bells where they go, oh, you know what? Hold on a second. Let's send in one of our people to see what how things are configured, because that, that something about that really smells wrong. Next up, we have Mihir. Mihir says, were you running into an unusual TempDB contention in multiple environments where despite having multiple files, we still get contentions on PFS and SCAM pages? What else can we do to resolve this? 28 files strikes me as really overkill. Like if you have 28 files, I start to suspect other problems. You shouldn't need more than four to eight. What I expect is happening is one of two things. Either you have catastrophically slow storage, like it's taking 500 milliseconds or longer on average in order to do a write, um, and you're running into other kinds of blocking which lead to PFS and GAM blocking, like objects are taking out locks in all kinds of places, uh, and that we're kind of misunderstanding what the TempDB contention is. Or you want to attend my Fundamentals of TempDB class, Fundamentals of TempDB, where I teach you how to fix these kinds of issues. The thing that I would start with is, this is going to sound absolutely crazy, but try in-memory 
table variable objects, in, in memory table variable objects can bypass some of these kinds of locking. And I talk about that in more details in my Fundamentals of TempDB class. I demonstrate this exact kind of unusual PFS and GAM page contention issue, show you how uh, table variables and in memory table variables uh, bypass that issue. So, uh, oh, Fundamentals of TempDB. Next up, we have Jim. Jim says, what should we configure MaxDOP to? Jim, get a pen and paper ready. I want you to write down the numbers. 280-6535. If you Google for SQL Server, 280-6535. That'll take you to Microsoft's guy, uh, uh, blog post, or uh, that's kind of blog post, uh, documentation article on exactly how you do that. You thought it was going to be like a pizza place or a liquor delivery place. That's Those are different numbers. To infinity and beyond. Next up, Count Chocula asks, Ah, Count Chocula, nice callback, nice in-joke to a, uh, a thing about how to write T-SQL. I like that. I see what you did there. That's actually really good. Um, says, is there any easy way to clear the SQL Server's index stats without rebooting? There are two, and you're going to hate both of them. One is setting the database offline and then onlining it again. It works. It's just not pretty. And the other one is recreating the indexes from scratch, which is also ludicrously unpretty. But unfortunately, there's not a way to just uh, run a command and have SQL Server reset the index usage stats. I totally, part of me says I wish they were there was, but I always keep in mind that Microsoft is a not a doesn't have unlimited free resources, and if I'm going to pick for something to them to, if I'm going to pick something for them to focus on it's probably not going to be resetting index usage statistics. Because most of the time when I want to do that, when I'm looking at somebody's server, it's because they've been up for months and they haven't done any patching either. So I'm like, yo, dog, how's about you go and patch instead? And that, that can apply to both SQL Server patches and Windows patches. Next up from the, the current questions from current live viewers, Neil asks, should we get a bigger, faster drive on Azure VM or build a software RAID in Windows with a bunch of smaller, slower ones? Is there a way to trial Azure hardware to test this? We tried a big drive with data log and TempDB together. It was fast. However, we haven't tested RAID. You haven't tested, huh? Are Azure VMs expensive? Not really. In fact, they're pretty cheap. You could spin one up and test your question. Less than 20 bucks. Oh, but you think I'm free and you think my time is free. I got news for you, Neil. Come on, get your credit card together and go test this. It'll take you 30 minutes. Go spin up a Windows VM. Use Crystal Disk Mark. It'll take you no time at all. Go test it and you get answers right away. Neil, that's why your answer your question didn't have any votes up for it. Come on now, put some skin in the game, Neil. Chris asks, are there levels of enterprise licensing for a VM guest versus a host? No, uh, there's only enterprise licensing and that's it. That's all there is. Uh, if the thing is, it's the number of cores that you license. So if you want to license the VM host, you have to license all of the physical hosts, all the physical cores on that host. You might be licensing way less cores than that right now just for your VM. And if you want to license the whole entire host, you have to buy licenses for all the whole entire host. But there's only one kind of enterprise license, and that's it. And last up, Margaret asks, Hi, Brent. We have some always-on clusters. Oh, man. I... Oh, with read-only secondaries in SQL Server 2016. We run an index reorg daily, and quite often that requires... Da, 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 da. Um, so here's the deal. Typically, when you have slow storage, it's only multiplied by the fact that you have always-on availability groups, because now we have to write across multiple places. The thing that I would ask you is, what's the problem 
that you're trying to solve with the index maintenance, what's the thing that you think is getting better? And people will say fragmentation. No, 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 no. What do users compare about that you think is getting better? Users aren't there going, oh, man, this looks like 16% fragmentation. You should do no, 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 no. Users want to know how fast their queries run. So test your hypothesis that you really need to do index reorgs daily. Test your hypothesis by not doing it. Hold off for a week and listen to your users. Are they any more upset or less upset? Don't go poking. Hey, is everything OK? I, I made a change and I was wondering if anything's there. Anytime users will be like, well, it was better or it was worse. They won't have any numbers to back it up. Just stop doing that. Stop doing index reorgs daily and see if new screams come in. And when new screams come in, find out why. Do root cause analysis on what it is that they're upset about, because I pretty much guarantee you that reorganizing the indexes isn't going to be the thing that gets you across the finish line. It needs to be something else. And for that something else, <laughs> It just so happens that I have a training class, my fundamentals week over in March. Does that sales voice ever get boring? I'll tell you, I never get bored of doing the sales voice. I think it's really funny. I always enjoy the, the voice for radio thing. Or I also enjoy the tractor pull voice. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at your local convention center, the, the tractors of doom were coming for you. You know, I always love that kind of voice too. I, the older that I get, the harder that it is to do that, especially when I start to do uh, more and more espresso, which my espresso cup is is out at the moment, so I have to worry about that. Uh, master of segways, but not the physical segways. I've ridden those, and I don't know that I would call myself mastering those. I think they are awesome. And you know what it does? That reminds me. Uh, it's so funny. So I am at the condo building that I'm at. It's literally right on the beach. Here, I'll show you. Uh, let's switch over and look at the, I think the pause screen. <laughs> will do it. Yeah. So this is the beach that I'm on. I'm going to zoom the camera out because that, that is a uh, camera right off of my office window. Um, so that that is my balcony or one of my balconies right there overlooking the ocean. I'm really close to the ocean. But that also means like I'm a 20 minute walk from downtown Cabo. Let's switch over to here. Um, so I'm like a 20 minute walk from downtown Cabo and it's a hilly walk. It's up and down. I have been thinking I'm like, well, I'll be I'm doing my my heart some good if I walk up and down this every day. But boy, it would be kind of cool to have a segue down here so that just if I wanted to go to the grocery store, then I need a trailer for my Segway. Maybe that's not such a good idea, but there's a, a, a Segway nearby. How long does it take to stumble? Well, when I go drinking, I actually drink at the bar here on the property. So I had two Bloody Marys this morning. I know you can hardly tell by the quality of my answers because the quality of my answers are always bad. <laughs> Why did it only do that? I have done the whole. There it goes. Okay, cool. Um, but yeah, so that, that I love because it's a relatively quick stumble. I can stumble back. And they stop serving at 5.30-ish, uh, 5.30 p.m., which sounds really early, but then I just go home and I have all kinds of stuff here. So that kind of works. All right, so thanks, y'all, for hanging out with me today, and I will see y'all at the next Office Hours. Adios, everybody.